and we're back with episode three of the image guided surgery podcast series where we talk to interventional radiologists and other departments that they're working with to take care of the complex pediatric surgical patient. This is Rod Gerardo. And I'm Am Tombash. We're research fellows at Cincinnati Children's Hospital Medical Center. And we're joined by Denise Liu. I am Denise Liu. I'm one of the uh, interventional radiology residents at the University of Toledo. And today we're going to talk about the use of hybrid OR during ROSA robot depth electrode placement for epilepsy evaluation and neuropace placement for seizure treatment. If you're like me, you're possibly wondering what is ROSA robot. ROSA, a robotic surgical assistant, is a surgical robot and its advanced technology manages the planning and measurement needed for an ideal patient outcome. Its 3D capability allows for precise bone resection and alignment during surgery. We have images for you posted below the media player in the app to see what we're talking about. I'm very excited. Let's get started. I was wondering if you could talk to us about before we had the hybrid OR, what was the process for deep brain simulation and anything that you see now different with this new technology um, and kind of big picture overview thoughts. The inception of robotic technology for the study of invasive monitoring in epilepsy surgery specifically has changed the landscape on really the way that we evaluate patients, certainly in 2022. That is Dr. Francesco Mangano. He is a pediatric neurosurgeon at Cincinnati Children's Hospital. The robot actually allows us to place multiple and many even bilateral depth electrodes through the cortical mantle into deep structures of the brain to monitor for seizures. Prior to the ability of us using the robot, we could do similar procedures with, with a frame. Those would, those would take a much longer period of time with a much higher, in my estimation, morbidity profile. So the other way that they did invasive monitoring for epilepsy prior to purchasing the robot was with craniotomies and the place of no subdural grid to map the cortex of the brain. The limitations with those procedures were that, for the most part, the grids that are placed on the surface of the brain don't collect electrical data from deep sources. And beyond that, they require a very large craniotomy. It's a much bigger operation. The risk of bleeding, the risk of CSF leak, the risk of infection is higher than making small millimeter burr holes and placing the electrodes as we do today. Since the time we purchased the robot and are now able to do these procedures in a much less invasive way, we began doing the operations in our typical standard operating room. That operating room doesn't have any imaging capabilities such as x-ray or CT. So we place the electrodes, complete the operation, and ensure that all the electrodes are working properly. We would then transfer the patient uh, to a gurney and bring them to a different floor where the CT scan would be obtained. And we would then make sure that no immediate intraoperative complications have occurred and that the electrodes were indeed in the location that we had planned. That is essentially a, a short version of how we used to do the operation before the hybrid room. So to back up again, before the hybrid OR, and if I'm being honest, I actually did a little bit of a Google search here because I'm kind of the, the blood and guts surgery resident, so I, I'm very clueless with this neurosurgery stuff. But I, I had to learn, teach myself a little bit about this, and I saw images of the frames that were used previously. They look very big. They look very bulky. I understand how you can kind of use those to pinpoint based on the imaging, but it, it sounds like it was a much larger operation, a much bulkier, cumbersome operation before and there was transport. When Nicole has explained to us, you know, it's not insignificant moving a patient from an operating room to imaging and back and forth if necessary. Um, so, so there are multiple barriers. Is that better to say? And before you answer, Nicole and Dr. Rocadio, from your perspective, how that seemed before the hybrid OR and then what changes you see now? The main thing was the ability to have imaging capabilities within the operating room. This is Dr. John Riccadio. He is a pediatric interventional radiologist and he's the director of the pediatric interface for radiology research and innovation. So in the hybrid OR, through the C-arm, we have 
not only the ability to, to look with live x-ray fluoroscopy, but also with the rotational acquisition of the C-arm, we can create a cone beam CT and those images are available immediately for Dr. Mangano and the neurosurgeons to, to evaluate and make sure that the electrodes are in an appropriate position and there isn't a complication that they would need to address. In the hybrid operating room, we can keep the patient sterile and draped so that if we have to go back quickly, we have that ability to go back quickly. We don't have to re-sterilize the field, bring in more clean instruments and, and all of that. And certainly from the standpoint of evaluating for a complication, if we identified a complication, it also allows us to quickly get to the problem and take care of it. And Dr. Mangano, can you tell them a little bit about what it takes for the facial registration? Because I think that's a thing that I wouldn't have known until I watched you guys, how much time that takes and how much it saves time by not having to take the patient out of the pins. And that is Nicole Hilvert. She is the program manager for the Image Guided Surgery Program. That is completed preoperatively through the patient's CT scan. So we take a significant number of points on the face including the forehead, the eyes, and the nose, as well as the temples, that then allow us to get within two millimeters of accuracy for registration of the brain. That whole process would take about 15 to 20 minutes, depending how smoothly they're able to get the patient in pins, lock the robot to the table, and then go through the registration process. Wow, this stuff is incredibly impressive to me. I know that in previous podcasts, Nicole has walked us through how the preoperative planning can be kind of complex for some of these cases, depending on what we're doing. Uh, you know, it's, I'm certain that there, this one is no different. So could you walk us through some of the pre-op preparation? How do you guys coordinate? What is the communication like? How do you guys move forward with this? Well, in this particular situation with these cases, the, the pre-op planning is really all done outside of the OR. We obtain a CTA and an, and an MRI, MRA, MRV and the DICOM images are loaded into a workstation that can then be connected to the robot in the operating room. So that workstation is able to automatically fuse the MRI with the CT. Based on our epilepsy surgery conference findings, I then make a plan as to where the electrodes need to be targeted. So there may be some patients where they want to target certain lobes or certain portions of a lobe on the left or the right side. And there are other patients where we may want to do a bilateral type of uh, invasive monitoring procedure. When it comes to the day of the surgery, we simply bring our laptop into the hybrid room and download the plan and the images into the, the robotic workstation. And that's how they pick the entry points on the scalp to actually place the bolts and then implant the electrodes through those bolts. We have a couple patients where we use alternative ways as opposed to using facial registration. Uh, oftentimes this is when we have to place the patient prone uh, because I mean you can't see the face at that point. The other way to do this is to insert, essentially screw bone fiducials into the skull, usually four or five of them. And then what you can do is spin the CT so you can visualize the patient's head as well as the bone fiducials, and you drive the robotic arm to each of those fiducials and register them to the scan that's already loaded in the machine. And that allows you to get accurate registration that way. Awesome. So from your point of view, Dr. Ricadio, what would you say is different? What would you say are the benefits or anything that has changed since this conversion to everything being in the same room? The whole process has evolved. What I think is important in the whole process is we work closely with the imaging neuroradiologists. So there's a process in place when immediately after the cone beam CT is acquired, Nicole is able to push uh, some of those images to our neuroradiologists. And they're already aware that there's going to be a, a case coming up at some point. So then Dr. Mangano and the neuroradiologist can discuss over the phone as they're looking at the images if either one of them has any questions about the placement or the possibility of any small complication, they're able to communicate directly. I think that this is the epitome of that at this point at Cincinnati Children's and our great collaboration with the folks that we work with in radiology that are always available to us. So there's no longer 
any traveling outside of the operating room. There's no longer any paging of a radiologist or an interventional person in the hybrid room. Everybody's immediately available, and that discussion happens in real time. Well, in my opinion, uh, it ultimately leads to improve. Patient safety, the proximity to the patient is paramount, and the fact that you know imaging is done real time, the evaluation is done real time, and the discussion with a multidisciplinary team is also done in the real time. So, for some of the other pediatric academic institutions around the country that don't have a hybrid OR, which it might be most of them, I would imagine. Uh, what would you say is the argument specifically for the Rosa machine and how you guys collaborate? What's the argument for institutions to start pushing this kind of advanced collaboration between departments like this? Is it the time? Is it the accuracy, like you mentioned? Is it the cost? We have an operating room that can be used for any neurosurgical procedure, whether it's minimally invasive or maximally invasive. Again, that's Dr. Mangano. In the end, really keeps the patient as safe as we can possibly be while performing a very invasive operation in a very minimal way. I think Francesco, you hit on all those key points. The technology is one thing, but certainly without that collaborative approach, you know, you're not going to really be able to utilize the technology to its fullest. I can say too, from my perspective, Dr. Mangano and Dr. Skosh really like allowed us to support them. Again, that's Nicole. Because at the beginning, we didn't have perfect images. We didn't know how we could really support them, but they gave us what they needed. We tested with vendors, you know, we talked and they're like, this isn't good enough. And so we worked to get it there. And you, they didn't just give up on us. They were working towards the goal of making it safer for their patients. And we got there together. One thing that we haven't talked about because we focus really on the placement of electrodes is that we have used the hybrid room for RNS placement. And to do that procedure, you also have to do a craniotomy on, on top of placing usually two depth electrodes wherever the target is. And I believe we've done one DBS case in that room as well with Dr. Scotch. So it's not just the placement of electrodes for invasive EEG. They use it also to treat patients. This kind of new technology that is being really trickle down to the pediatric population at this point. I'm just fascinated by the new frontiers that are being developed, so I look forward to being a part of it. With this podcast series in particular, is is this going to be relevant three years later when someone goes back and listens to it? Uh, part of me is like, I hope not. I, I hope that you guys are doing something even more impressive with this technology and kind of like what you were saying, Dr. Riccadio, this is still an evolution. Like, who knows what it's going to look like a few years down the road, 10 years down the road, what we'll be able to do at Cincinnati Children's with this technology in the future. The evolution of what we do and what we can do in this collaborative approach in the hybrid OR, every time we, we do different cases with different colleagues, a little spark of imagination might come up and someone will say, hey, do you think we could do this? And uh, we have that discussion. And before you know it, we're starting a new way of doing something that we would have never imagined. So. I think having this open collaborative approach is certainly special and really gives us an opportunity to push boundaries and, and come up with creative things that, that we never would have thought we would be doing. So there you have it. Episode three of our image guided surgery podcast series, specifically on the Rosa robot neurosurgery and uh, interventional radiology working together in the same room to improve the outcomes for the pediatric surgical patients. I think it's amazing. If you don't fine, Either way, leave us a comment, leave us a rating, whether you're watching us on YouTube, listening to us on Apple Podcasts, SoundCloud, Stitcher, Amazon Music, or in my opinion, the best way to watch or listen is the Stay Current Pediatric Surgery app. It's free in the Apple App Store or the Google Play Store. You can download it today. But until then, this is Rod Gerardo. I'm Em Tombash. And I'm Denise Lu. And remember, knowledge should be free.